Do not fear threats, for a time will arrive when everything concealed will be exposed, and all secrets will be brought to light. What is shared with you in the shadows, proclaim boldly in the light, and what is whispered in your ear, declare it from the rooftops. The third prophecy of Fatima is one of the Church's most mysterious revelations, and now the time has come to reveal it. For many years, those who safeguarded this secret insisted that the moment had not yet come for its unveiling. It wasn't until the year 2000 that Pope John Paul Roman II finally opened the envelope containing its contents. The Pope explained that these prophecies spoke of hell, the devastation of two world wars, the suffering of Christians in the 20th century, and the resurgence of communism as a force seeking global dominance. But how accurate are the predictions given by Our Lady of Fatima? Why do some believe that 2024 is the year when these prophecies will come to fruition? Could any part of this secret shed light on the current state of the world? Stay with us until the end of this video as we delve deep into the third prophecy of Fatima. We are living in the age of the third secret, so why has God not yet punished the world for its sins over the last century? Most likely, God in His infinite mercy has granted the Church and the world a period of grace for repentance. But how long will this grace last? Now that we are in 2024, it is clear that the world is becoming stranger and more chaotic by the day, and this applies not only to society, but to the Church itself. The third secret of Fatima has only been partially revealed, and it may point to the current crises affecting the Church. Fatima's story is one of faith, mystery, and miracles, continuing to inspire millions around the globe. The Virgin Mary's message of peace and penance still holds relevance today, urging us to reflect and pray for peace in the world. In 1941, 23 years after the apparitions, Lucia dos Santos, under orders from the Bishop of Fatima, was asked to write down the secrets given to her and the other two children by the Virgin Mary. She wrote down the first two secrets quickly, but she hesitated when it came to the third. Only out of obedience did she eventually put the third secret to paper, sealing it in an envelope, with instructions not to open it until 1960, when it was thought that the world would be ready to understand its message. In 2000, Pope John Paul Roman II beatified Francisco and Jacinta Marto, the youngest non-martyr saints in the Roman Catholic Church, marking the centennial of the Fatima apparitions. Pope Francis later canonized them in 2017. Our Lady of Fatima entrusted the children with three prophetic secrets or visions during a series of apparitions. The first was a horrifying vision of hell. Lucia recounted that the Virgin Mary showed them a glimpse of the torments of hell, complete with the soul's suffering and agony. The vision, though brief, was nearly unbearable for the children, but it deepened their faith in Mary's promise to guide her followers toward Christ and save souls from eternal suffering. In the second secret, the Virgin Mary revealed a prophecy of future conflict. Although World War I was still ongoing at the time of the apparitions, she predicted its end, but warned that another, more destructive war would soon follow. This was fulfilled with the start of World War II in 1939. These secrets are not merely distant warnings, but also calls to action, urging us to live lives of faith and devotion. Our Lady of Fatima's messages provide guidance through hope and penance, offering a path to avoid the dangers humanity faces. Now we turn to the elusive third secret of Fatima, a prophecy that has been the subject of much speculation and secrecy. Some of Lucia's statements, particularly her complaints that the Pope had not performed the consecration to Mary requested by the Virgin, fueled speculation that the third secret contained apocalyptic visions that the Vatican might prefer to keep hidden to prevent widespread panic. Following the assassination attempt on his life in 1981, Pope John Paul EI's connection to the Fatima prophecy deepened. He made a pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady of Fatima, placing the bullet that had wounded him into the crown of her statue as a sign of his gratitude for her protection. The Pope himself acknowledged that while one hand had fired the gun, another hand had guided the bullet, sparing his life. While the secret remained hidden for nearly two decades after the assassination attempt, there were attempts as early as 1984 to disclose its content. Many believed that its revelation might coincide with significant dates linked to the apparitions. The mention of Russia in the earlier secrets 
coupled with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, sparked renewed interest and speculation. The message given by the angel in the vision, calling for penance to prevent earthly disasters, should not be taken lightly. The third secret, as finally revealed, emphasizes the need for prayer and devotion, especially to the Virgin Mary, as a way to protect against future calamities. The assassination attempt on Pope John Paul Roman II is often cited as an instance of the prophecy being fulfilled, with the Pope believed to be the bishop in white mentioned in the vision. However, the third secret also points to a larger message, the power of prayer and penance in safeguarding the Church and the faithful from spiritual collapse. In times of trial and uncertainty, the Virgin Mary's message remains a call to action for believers. The Church continues to face persecution, and it is through the prayers of the faithful and the intercession of Mary that it is protected. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. It is truly astonishing how the bullet managed to pass through such delicate areas of the Pope's body without striking any major organs. Nearly two decades would pass before the Pope made the decision to release the secret. In 1984, there was an attempt to unveil it, and another group advocated for its disclosure on May 13, marking the anniversary of the first apparition. As Russia was directly referenced in earlier portions of the message, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 reignited speculation. The angel's call for penance to prevent earthly disasters should not be ignored. The message of Fatima aligns with what was revealed in the third secret, emphasizing that prayer and devotion to the Virgin Mary should be accompanied by acts of penance. Mary's unique relationship with her son gives her the power to avert calamities. The third secret is often connected with the assassination attempt on Pope John Paul Roman II, leading many to believe he is the bishop in white seen by the children in their vision. However, the prophecy seems to carry a broader significance. Perhaps the essential lesson is that both prayer and penance must be embraced as the most effective defenses against a widespread abandonment of faith. Apostasy, the act of rejecting one's faith, once seen as a way to escape persecution, has become fashionable in many parts of the Western world. It's considered trendy to distance oneself from religious institutions, yet, ironically, the 20th century saw an increase in the number of martyrs. Russia, in particular, became a land with countless martyrs and severe persecution of Christians. The Virgin Mary's call for prayer and penance has not been sufficiently heeded, limiting her ability to intercede as she had hoped. The conversion of Russia, as requested in the prophecy, remains incomplete. Mary instructed the shepherd children to pray for the Pope, knowing that her message would be difficult for him to bear, but also a source of comfort and strength. The clear takeaway from the third secret is a call to prayer, particularly for bishops and the Pope. The Church, both in the 20th century and now in the 21st, continues to face persecution, and it requires the protection that prayer and Mary's mantle can provide. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. The Vatican disclosed the third secret of Fatima on June 26, 2000. The vision described by the children is as follows. To the left of the Virgin Mary and slightly above her, they saw an angel with a flaming sword. The sword emitted flames that seemed poised to engulf the world in fire, but these flames were extinguished by the brilliant light that the Virgin radiated from her right hand. The angel, pointing toward the earth with his right hand, cried out in a booming voice, Penance, penance, penance. The children then saw a great light, an intense representation of God, and within this light, a bishop dressed in white, whom they believed to be the Pope. They witnessed other bishops, priests, and religious figures, as well as laypeople, climbing a steep mountain at the top of which stood a large cross made from roughly hewn wood, similar to the bark of a cork tree. Before reaching the summit, the Pope passed through a city in ruins, his steps faltering under the weight of pain and sorrow. Along the way, he prayed for the souls of the dead he encountered. Upon reaching the foot of the cross, the Pope knelt in prayer, but was killed by a group of soldiers who fired both bullets and arrows at him. One by one, the other religious figures and laypeople accompanying him were also killed. Beneath the arms of the cross stood two angels, each holding a crystal container in which they collected the blood of the martyrs. With this blood, they sprinkled the souls making their journey toward God. 
The Vatican's official interpretation of this vision is that it symbolized the 1981 assassination attempt on Pope John Paul Roman II. However, as many of you know, Cardinal Ratzinger stated that Catholics are not obligated to accept this interpretation as definitive. While there seems to be no reason to doubt that what was revealed is indeed part of the third secret, other aspects of the prophecy leave room for further interpretation. The issues with the third secret become evident in various other aspects. This vision, experienced by the seers, depicted a bishop dressed in white interpreted as the Pope struggling up a mountain through a partially destroyed city, accompanied by many Catholics from all walks of life. At the summit, there stood a rough wooden cross, and it was here that the Pope, along with his followers, was killed. When the vision was revealed in 2000, it was interpreted as symbolic of the suffering endured by the Church during the 20th century. There have been extreme reactions to the Third Secret, with some Fatima devotees going so far as to stage hunger strikes. One even hijacked a plane in an attempt to force the Vatican to fully disclose the secret. During Pope John Paul II's first visit to the Fatima Shrine in 1982, on the first anniversary of the assassination attempt on his life, a Spanish priest armed with a knife tried to kill him, but was subdued by security. The Pope has always credited the Virgin of Fatima for sparing his life, and during his 1982 visit, a bullet that had been removed from his body was placed alongside jewels in a golden crown worn by a statue of the Virgin Mary. In 1991, on the 10th anniversary of the attack, Pope John Paul Roman II returned to Fatima once more to express his gratitude for both his survival and the fall of communism, which many believers argue was also predicted by the Virgin Mary in 1917. During this visit, Cardinal Sedano announced that the Pope's pilgrimage was intended as a renewed gesture of thankfulness to Our Lady for her protection throughout his years as pontiff. This protection seemed closely tied to the so-called Third Secret of Fatima. Though Pope John Paul Roman II referenced the prophecies during his speeches at Fatima, mentioning the tribulations they foretold, he did not directly speak about the Third Secret at that time. Instead, he reiterated his thanks to God for sparing his life on that fateful May 13, 1981. This event reinforced the Pope's belief that Our Lady of Fatima had intervened to save him from death, as the assassination attempt occurred on the 65th anniversary of the first Fatima apparition. The Pope believed that a guiding, motherly hand had altered the trajectory of the bullet, saving him from the brink of death. The Pope first learned of the third secret shortly after his election in 1978, according to the Vatican. However, he did not choose to announce it himself, as stated by his spokesperson Dr. Joaquin Navarro Valls, due to the deeply personal nature of the secret's message. Vatican officials did not provide a clear explanation as to why the secret had not been revealed earlier, even after the assassination attempt in 1981. One significant gesture of the Pope's devotion to Fatima was his decision to advance the sainthood process for the two children, Francisco and Jacinta Marto, who witnessed the Virgin's apparitions. Both were put on the path to sainthood, becoming the first non-martyr children to be beatified by the Roman Catholic Church. For decades, the third secret of Fatima was regarded by many as one of the Church's great unsolved mysteries, especially since it had been shared privately with Lucia and withheld from the public for many years. This secrecy led to widespread speculation and numerous conspiracy theories about its content. What seemed clear, however, was that the message reinforced the grave warning that humanity faced a turbulent future, full of chaos and hardship, if it did not turn away from its sinful ways. I think we can all agree, regardless of our religious or political views, that the world is becoming stranger and more chaotic with each passing day, and yes, this turbulence has even affected the Church. During a 1980 visit to Fulda, Germany, Pope John Paul Roman II was asked about the third secret of Fatima. His response was striking. If the message foretells oceans engulfing entire regions and millions of people perishing suddenly, he suggested that there would be little point in making the prophecy public. He went on to say that many seek to know the secret merely out of curiosity or for sensationalism, without considering the weight of responsibility that comes with that knowledge. He warned that satisfying such curiosity is dangerous, 
unless one is fully convinced that nothing can be done to avert the disaster predicted. Later, Cardinal Ratzinger, in an interview, indirectly confirmed that the third secret did indeed contain warnings of catastrophic events. His comment that revealing the secret would add nothing essential for Christians to know and could expose the Church to sensationalism and misuse of its content, further implied that the third secret contained unsettling revelations. Both Pope John Paul Roman II and Cardinal Ratzinger seemed to sidestep direct answers. But why? If the third secret did not contain dire warnings, why not simply deny it? A straightforward no would have diffused the speculation and removed much of the mystery surrounding it. For decades, the core message of Fatima has been known to the world. The Blessed Mother warned that unless humanity repented of its sins, especially those of the flesh, and the breakdown of marriages, great suffering would befall the world. She also revealed that wars were punishments for these sins. So, when the Vatican declared in 2000 that it had fully revealed the third secret, many were left underwhelmed. The general reaction was, that's it. The Vatican's explanation that the prophecy referred to past events, such as an attack on the Pope that he survived, seemed at odds with the urgency of the warnings the Virgin Mary had been giving for years. Instead, people looked around and saw a world still plunging into moral decay and evil, just as the Virgin had cautioned. Who can deny that the sacred bond of marriage between a man and woman has eroded? Families are disintegrating, and now even suicide is legally sanctioned in many places. The list of evils is well known and continues to grow. Many question why the Virgin Mary chose to reveal her message to three young children when so many adults were around at the time. This choice was no coincidence. It serves as a powerful reminder that not every child will experience such a grace from Our Lady, but these particular children were destined to carry her message. The lives of Lucia Francisco and Jacinta the Little Shepherds of Fatima are a testament to grace and mercy. In these children, we witness a profound paradox, the contrast between the pride and power of the world's rulers with their plans and conflicts, and the humble simplicity of those chosen by God to be catalysts for transforming humanity. As vessels of God's mercy, these shepherd children were called to share the message they had received, living as simple witnesses to the presence of divine love. They were selected to reflect the light of God, making His merciful face visible to the world. Beneath the shade of an oak tree, Our Lady revealed herself to the children, showing them a radiant light, a light that was a reflection of God Himself. Born in the small village of Algestral, part of the Fatima parish in the early 20th century, Francisco, Jacinta, and their cousin Lucia grew up in modest, rural families in a quiet, remote village. They did not know how to read or write, and had little knowledge of the world beyond their surrounding hills and valleys. Their Christian education was simple, fitting the secluded environment in which they lived. Lucia's mother was the one who introduced her daughter and nephews to the catechism, and Lucia, being older, took it upon herself to teach her younger cousins the biblical stories and prayers she had learned from her mother. Despite their modest beginnings and simple religious instruction, their parents lived out their faith in a way that left a lasting impression on the children. They set an example of faithfulness, participating in Sunday Mass, praying as a family, showing honesty and respect for all, and practicing charity towards the poor. Lucia, in particular, was a thoughtful and observant child, constantly seeking to be enveloped in God's love. This yearning for God's embrace guided her throughout her life. Francisco, with his deep, contemplative nature, often found solace in the beauty of the natural world. He would sit in silent reflection, gazing at the wonders of creation, lost in the majesty of the Creator. He was captivated by the rising and setting of the sun, which he viewed as nature's candle, a symbol of God's brilliance. The candle of the Lord held a deep meaning for young Penta, but she especially favored the light of Our Lady, symbolized by the moon gentle and easy on the eyes. She shared a close bond with her cousin Lucia, for whom she had great affection. Together they tended the sheep, calling each one by name and caring for them tenderly, as if they were following in the footsteps of the Lord Himself. These children lived their lives with pure devotion, giving all their love to God without distraction or unnecessary thoughts. In return, they received a divine answer on a spring afternoon in 1916. 
After finishing a simple prayer, the little shepherd saw a light above the trees whiter than snow and taking the form of a young man, transparent as crystal in sunlight. In that moment, they could not have imagined that this radiant figure was the messenger of God's peace, preparing them for a profound spiritual journey. It was utterly unexpected, and the children were drawn into contemplation of the immense light, caught up in an atmosphere so intense that they were left speechless, overwhelmed by the presence of God. This angel of peace visited them three times during the spring and summer of 1916, imprinting his words deeply into their minds. He revealed to them a light that made them understand who God is, how deeply he loves, and how much he desires to be loved in return. The angel spoke of God's heart, a heart attentive to the humble, filled with a plan of mercy. He invited the children into a profound adoration of the Holy Trinity and encouraged them to unite themselves with Christ's sacrifice for the reconciliation of all in God. During one of these visits, the angel offered them the body and blood of Christ, marking the beginning of their calling. From that moment on, they would be asked to offer themselves in sacrifice for those who were ungrateful, for all those who did not live with a heart of thanksgiving. The little shepherds, transformed by this encounter, began to live in deep devotion, silently and courageously dedicating their lives as offerings to God for the good of others. This became their lifelong vocation. On May 13, 1917, a new chapter unfolded when the Virgin Mary, shining brighter than the sun, appeared to them. For six consecutive months, on the 13th of each month, she returned, renewing her invitation for them to offer their lives as humble witnesses of God's heart in a world full of suffering. Are you willing to offer yourselves to God, she asked, and bear all the sufferings he wills to send you as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended, and as supplication for the conversion of sinners? Through a series of visions shown by Our Lady, the children came to realize that God's heart was deeply invested in the course of human history. They understood that sin was a failure to care about God's heart, and that God, ever merciful, continually seeks out mankind despite its struggles and tragedies. Those who embrace the light of God's heart are called to join in His work through prayer and sacrifice, participating in His care for humanity. From their first encounter with this divine light, Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta, still filled with the profound echoes of their experience, initially resolved to keep silent about what had occurred. But Jacinta, profoundly moved by the beauty of Our Lady and filled with irrepressible joy, could not contain herself. She became the first messenger of the divine joy that the Virgin had bestowed upon them, like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, who felt a burning in their hearts upon encountering the risen Christ. Jacinta confessed to her friends, I have something inside me that will not let me be silent. The news of the apparitions of Our Lady of the Rosary quickly spread, and the number of pilgrims coming to the Kova da Iria grew steadily. The children soon found themselves facing doubt, opposition, and suffering. From the very first encounter, the Virgin had warned them that they would endure many hardships, just as the prophets had. This suffering became a central part of their mission, as they were accused of fraud and greed. Even their families, except for Francisco and Jacinta's father, feared they were spreading falsehoods and worried for their safety. At home and wherever they went, the children were constantly visited and interrogated, facing relentless questioning. But the greatest trial they would endure came on August 13, when their suffering reached a peak. On that fateful morning, the children were unexpectedly visited by the local municipal administrator, a man known for his Masonic beliefs and free-thinking ways. Determined to uncover the secret the children had been entrusted with, he questioned them both at home and at the rectory, attempting to pry the information they had refused to divulge. Using cunning and deception, he offered to take them to the Kova da Iria, but instead he led them elsewhere. Once there, he relentlessly pressured them to reveal the secret, going so far as to imprison them alongside criminals and even threatening to have them boiled in oil. In response, Francisco's innocent and peaceful words echoed with calm. If they kill us, it doesn't matter, we'll go to heaven. From that point onward, the lives of the shepherd children became entirely attuned to God's heart. The yes they had offered to the lady, more radiant than the sun, 
was renewed constantly as Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta devoted themselves even more passionately to their love for God. God's presence became sacred ground for them, much like when Moses stood barefoot before the burning bush. Their bond with the divine deepened, transforming into an act of pure adoration in the light of God's presence, which illuminated their hearts without consuming them. This divine fire inside them, like the burning bush, kindled a mission to care for souls bound by sin and ingratitude. In the eyes of those around them, they became visible reflections of God's light. Before God, they acted as mediators on behalf of humanity. Their lives were a continual offering every action, no matter how small, was given for the love of God and the salvation of sinners. Each of the children took on this calling in their own unique way, embodying different aspects of their shared mission. Francisco, deeply contemplative, was especially attuned to the divine light. He embraced the call to worship and spent his time in quiet adoration of God. Little Jacinta, full of purity and joy, translated her faith into everyday life. She turned even the simplest tasks into acts of sacrifice for humanity, offering her life as a reflection of God's love. Lucia, on the other hand, took up the role of evangelist, charged with spreading the message of God's mercy and fulfilling the call to consecrate the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Lucia became the one who ensured that the light of the secret, the mystery of God's mercy shone without interruption, a witness to the divine message remembered at Fatima. Francisco and Jacinta's lives were brief and unassuming, yet they lived solely for love the love revealed to them through the hands of a beautiful lady, Our Lady of Fatima. By the end of 1918, both children succumbed to the deadly pneumonia epidemic sweeping through their village. The lady had promised them they would soon be in heaven, and they understood that their time on earth was short. Who could have guessed that such simple and fleeting lives could be filled with such immense love and purpose? At the heart of the messages they received was a consistent theme, the call to conversion. The sins of humanity, particularly those of selfishness and moral decay, were identified as the root cause of the world's suffering. This message of repentance remains timeless, always urging humanity to return to God's love. Pope John Paul Roman II felt a special connection to Our Lady of Fatima, especially after surviving the assassination attempt on his life. He credited his survival to her guiding hand. Despite being shot three times, two bullets passed through his abdomen without hitting vital organs, and a third came dangerously close to his heart, narrowly missing it. He believed this miraculous survival was a direct result of the Virgin's protection. In a 1997 message for the World Day of the Sick, Pope John Paul Roman II emphasized the profound importance of Our Lady of Fatima's call for repentance, describing it as an expression of her deep concern for the well-being of humanity. He noted that the Virgin Mary, through her message, seemed to perceive the signs of the times with remarkable clarity. Her persistent call for penance, he explained, was a reflection of her motherly care for a world in desperate need of conversion and forgiveness. Pope Benedict Roman XVI shared a similar devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. In recognition of Sister Lucia's pivotal role in the Fatima apparitions, he waived the customary five-year waiting period to advance her cause for sainthood. In a message delivered at the Fatima Shrine in 2010, Pope Benedict reflected on the Virgin's call for humanity to relinquish worldly comforts and fully offer themselves to God. He drew parallels between this call and the frequent references in Scripture, where God seeks righteous men and women to save humankind, noting that the same pattern is evident at Fatima when the Virgin asked, Are you willing to offer yourselves to God, to bear all the sufferings He sends you, as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended, and to pray for the conversion of sinners. At a time when humanity seemed willing to sacrifice all that is sacred for selfish interests, be it in the name of nations, races, ideologies, or groups, the Blessed Mother descended from heaven to offer the flame of God's love that burns within her own heart. Though her message was initially given to just three children, the impact of their example soon spread across the world. Through the travels of the Pilgrim Virgin and the countless groups dedicated to promoting fraternal solidarity, the message of Fatima has continued to resonate, encouraging people everywhere to embrace God's love and mercy. Thank you for watching today's video on Faith in God. 
If you found inspiration or comfort in today's message, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you never miss an update. Remember, no matter the challenges we face, God's love is always with us. Stay blessed, stay faithful, and keep trusting in His plan. See you in the next video.